Hello everyone, welcome to session 14 of Biostatistics and Biomedical Research. I'm Frank Harrell of the Department of Biostatistics at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in Nashville. I'm glad you're here. Um, last time we talked about simple linear regression and today we're going to pick up with uh, multiple linear regression. And uh, before we get into that, we're going to cover uh, an important topic about how you uh, might pre-transform variables before entering them into a regression model. As always, um, if you're watching this live on YouTube, uh, be sure to set the chat to live so that you can take part in questions and answers. And if you're watching offline, look for the dedicated topic for this session uh, on datamethods.org. Uh, so let's first turn to the practice of percentiling and what kind of problems that causes for modeling your data. The version of the notes that I'm referring to today is from March 8th, 2020. So we have this section 10.6 in the BBR notes on proper transformations and percentiling. Uh, something you might get involved in before you uh, fit a model. Um, and as we'll see later, uh, a more logical approach to this is to model the covariate effects more flexibly uh, so that you don't need to worry about pre-transformations. And we know that all parametric and semi-parametric regression models makes us assumptions about how the predictors relate to the outcome. And a lot of analysts uh, tend to assume that things are linear, which is not very commonly true. Regression splines are natural uh, nonlinear generalizations that are really giving us much more flexibility in modeling and fitting the data better. There's a practice, however, that's fairly common in epidemiology uh, where analysts are percentiling variables before they are analyzed either in, t in constructing tables or in fitting in regression models. I'd like to know the origin of this practice because it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, percentiling is when you have um, students competing against each other and you might set some arbitrary rule that the top 10% are going to get an A, um, which doesn't make any sense either. Uh, but when you're modeling outcomes, it doesn't make any sense at all for a variable to predict the outcome according to how many subjects have a similar value to a current value you're examining. Um, so the, the act of percentiling or creating percentile groups or quantile groups assumes that X affects Y through the population distribution, um, whereas in reality, things affect the outcome variable through physics, physiology, anatomy, uh, and not through how the sample was constituted, not through how many subjects are less than or greater than your value. And so if you use uh, quantiles or percentiles uh, in, in formulating how to model a variable, you're actually allowing the definition of the variable to change as the population accommodates. Um, so let's look at the ramification of this. Let's assume we're modeling body mass index and let's say it has a normal distribution with a mean of 28 and a standard deviation of 2 in a certain population. And that distribution will be shown um, in, the, in the graph that follows. We're also going to show the relationship between raw body mass index and the percentile of body mass index and we're going to assume that the relationship between body mass index and the risk is a certain form. And uh, let's go ahead and look at that. Um, and here's how we generate the relationships. And let's, let's see what we have. So this is the upper left panel uh, body mass index distribution. And um, very, you see it's assumed to be normal, so that's going to be symmetric. And then if you calculate the cumulative distribution function and you rescale it to go 0 to 100 instead of 0 to 1, this is just the cumulative area under the curve on the left. So you can see where the density is the highest uh, 
is where this slope is the steepest, where you're accumulating a large number of observations in the middle. Now let's suppose the actual risk relationship between BMI and the outcome is of this form. Let's say there's a flat risk until you reach some threshold, such as a BMI of 25, and then let's say the risk is linear after that. Well, if you start to percentile the body mass index, um, you're actually converting a, uh, a risk equation to a very, very strange transformation. So you can see the relationship between body mass index percentile and the risk is, uh, you see this little flat area in here, which corresponds to this wider area on the raw data scale, um, and then this linear, and then an extremely rapid takeoff um, out here where there's a lot of action. Uh, but that action uh, out here is really being compressed uh, into a small region in the percentile space. So why do we talk about percentile space? Well, it's very common, unfortunately, for researchers to divide into deciles or quintiles or quartiles and then to actually model the variable in the quartile numbers uh, as if that is linear. And so it's a very unrealistic transformation that's like this transformation here. It's not a natural transformation to use in regression modeling. And so um, this just goes through a little more background information and, and the problems you get into in percentiling. And so if you were to group the data into quantile groups, let's say not percentiles, which would give you, um, I guess, 101 groups, but um, let's say you used a smaller number of groups, you're going to have a lot of loss of information and heterogeneity within the group. And um, grouping into quintiles and then using the quintile number in a linear model um, is really assuming a bizarre shape of the relationship between, say, body mass index and some outcome variable. Now, why do we talk about using this? Well, this is the so-called test for trend. And I can't tell you how many papers I've seen where quartiles or quintiles are computed, the data are divided into, say, fifths, and then the numbers one to five are put into an actual test. This so-called test for trend, in my view, has been obsolete for more than 30 or 40 years, but we're still seeing it in the literature. And so um, let's look at that another way, which is to um, look at the quantile intervals. Say we have the body mass index uh, with this mean of 28 and a standard deviation of 2. We're just simulating a, uh, a random variable that has that property. And then um, we see now how we are mapping the original body mass index into these quintiles and these five numbers uh, that might be put into the so-called test for trend. Um, it's, it's kind of unbelievable that somebody wouldn't just get the idea of correlating BMI with the outcome variable uh, instead of dividing it up like this. Uh, but you see that uh, the relationship between the raw value and the quintile number uh, of course, it's going to go up, but then you have um, fairly homogeneous distribution of body mass index in the interior uh, where the intervals are short because the sample size in that middle area is much bigger to divide up. But then in the outer groups, you have this totally unacceptable, uh, extreme amount of unexplained heterogeneity in body mass index. Uh, you see that at the lower tail and in the upper tail. So just a lot of problems with that practice. So I hope we can start seeing a lot less of that. So what we're going to talk about now is uh, given that you're interested in a an ordinary least square sort of linear multiple regression model. And at, at present, we're going to assume that things are acting linear, linearly and you didn't need to uh, do some complicated transformation um, of, of the variable, so um, of any of the variables. So in contrast to single simple linear regression that we talked about last time, we now have p-independent variables, which are denoted x1 to xp. Uh, 
and these could represent multiple risk factors, a treatment variable, um, symptoms and clinical signs, and uh, you might be adjusting for um, confounding in a non-randomized experiment, so you have to account for non-random treatment assignment or treatment selection. Uh, you might be adjusting for a set of controlled or uncontrolled factors in an experimental study. And in a randomized study, you're going to control for variables uh, because that makes the outcome uh, variability that's explained uh, get, get bigger. Uh, so you leave less unexplained variation in the y variable. So each variable is going to have its own regression coefficient or slope. And those regression coefficients can be called partial regression coefficients. And they represent the partial effects, the effect of increasing a variable by one unit, holding all other variables constant. So we're initially going to assume that everything is acting in an additive fashion. And the variables are acting linearly against the response variable. So this is our multiple regression model y is equal to the intercept alpha plus beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x 2 all the way to beta p x p and then we have our random error or residual and just as before you can write it in this other form the long-term average or expected value of y uh, is equal to alpha plus beta 1 x 1 and so on where since we're taking the average the errors average out we have a zero over here now in the case of two predictors, that's what your equation looks like. And then we're going to estimate that um, uh, the relationship between x1, x2, and y to get the predicted values y hat. And we're going to let a stand for the estimated value of alpha, which will be a least squares estimate, and b1 for beta 1, b2 for beta 2. And just as before, uh, we have this least squares criterion for fitting the model and estimating the parameters. So we are going to calculate the sum of squared errors, which is the observed minus the predicted. And uh, the sum of those squares is our sum of squared residuals. And we're going to solve for A, B1, and B2 that minimize the sum of squared errors. That's what least squares estimates are doing. Now we have... Um, a simple formula that we learned last time when p is equal to 1, but the formulas get messy when p is greater than 1. It's not messy if you know uh, how to invert a matrix, uh, but all of the uh, coefficient estimates are weighted combinations of the y's, and uh, so it, they're of this form, the sum of w i y sub i, but the way you get those weights involves uh, matrix calculations. So um, we're going to spend a moment talking about interpretation of parameters. So we mentioned those, those little b's are partial regression coefficients. Uh, so an example of a partial effect is you have a model with x1 is equal to age, x2 is sex, where 0 is the reference cell uh, for males and 1 is for females. The coefficient of age is the change in the mean of y for males. Uh, when age increases by uh, one year. It's also the change in y per unit increase in age for females. And so this model doesn't have an age by sex interaction, so it is the age effect for both males and females. Whereas beta 2 is going to be the female minus the male mean, so that gives you a difference in means between females and males. Uh, for two subjects, they have the same age. So the expected value of y given x1 and x2 is equal to alpha plus beta 1 x1 if you're a male. It's equal to alpha plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 if you're a female. The age effect is the same in both. And so um, you see that for females, you've just shifted the intercept of the linear regression in age so you have a new intercept, which is the original intercept for males, plus the difference in females and males. And then you have the same slope for age as you had before. Uh, another model might be a model with age and systolic blood pressure. 
that measures uh, when somebody begins a study and then you get a coefficient of blood pressure that's the change in mean y when blood pressure increases by one millimeter mercury for subjects of the same age. So this leads to the question, what do we mean by changing a variable? Um, we, we, if, if you just say to change a variable, you're sort of implying causality or the ability to have total control in an experiment and manipulate a condition. Uh, but we usually mean change in a less stringent way. Uh, we mean uh, some sort of subtraction, difference, a comparison of two subjects, say, with different blood pressures. Uh, but we might envision what would be the expected response had a single subject's blood pressure been one millimeter of mercury greater than it was. And so that is... Uh, more of a causal statement, but it's not a longitudinal statement. So we're not talking about the blood pressure changing over time. We're saying what would have happened if it had started out at a different blood pressure. And so we can predict that and use subtraction to get the adjusted effect of a variable. So if you hold S x2 constant at the value s, but you increase x1 from a to a plus 1, you see that you write out the whole expression for the model and everything cancels out and you're left with beta 1. So let's say you had a model that was fitted and you're uh, predicting some response variable y and the equation is 37 plus 0.01 times your weight plus 0.5 times the number of cigarettes smoked today uh, per day. So 0.01 is the estimate of the average increase in Y across subjects when weight is increased uh, by one uh, pound if you didn't hold, if you didn't change anything else, um, if cigarette smoking is unchanged. 0.5 is the estimate of the average increase in Y across subjects per additional cigarette smoke per day if the weight does not change. And 37 is the estimated mean of a subject uh, who has a weight of zero and who does not smoke. So that intercept in and of itself isn't that interesting because zero weight is outside the range of possibility. But we need the intercept in the model to really make the other coefficients sensible and to handle arbitrary centering of the y variable. Uh, now what about comparing different regression coefficients? Well, you can't really compare them directly if the x's are in a different unit of measurement. So here we had smoking or weight. Can't really compare those coefficients. Um, you could standardize the coefficients uh, by uh, bringing in the standard deviation of y and the standard deviation of x1 or x2 and, and scaling such that the slopes are unitless. If there was only one variable and you did this, you would get the correlation coefficient. But that standardization is not really recommended because the standard deviation is not a magic summary of scale. And uh, you also would get the wrong answer doing that if x is categorical like sex and you calculated the standard deviation of a 0, 1 variable. So we're going to go to a classic example. This was from a study that was done by Du Bois and Du Bois in 1916, and it, they developed a regression equation for body surface area that I think is still used today. And if you go back to uh, see what data were used, uh, you see these data points here. So they were estimating body surface area from uh, humans' uh, height and weight how would you get a good approximation? Because the way they measured the real body surface area took a lot of work. And I think in this day, they, they covered uh, a body with squares of paper mache and made all the squares fit together. Then they take them off the body and lay them out and measure the surface area. And so you have to have some way of measuring the real thing. Um, and now can we approximate the body surface area uh, using height and weight and how well can we approximate it. So th this is our uh, data set and uh, when you plot the data uh, you see these circles uh, really uh, this is not plotting the data, this is plotting the predicted values from the model uh, 
uh, which is peaking ahead. So the predictive values are almost too good to be true. And things are just really lining up here with, with very little error. And it might have been because they had wonderful control and excellent measurements. Uh, but it almost looks a little bit too good to be true for me. So the model that they developed, um, they found that what worked well was to take the logs of all the variables and make an additive model in the logs. So you're going to get a multiplicative model in the body surface area. So this is um, ordinary least squares predicting the log to the base 10 of the body surface area from an additive model in the log weight and the log height. And you see the output. We have a residual standard deviation of log BSA of only 0 0.0069, which is very small. The R squared is 0.999. So we have almost perfect estimation of body surface area given height and weight. So we're going in faith that they didn't throw out any outliers or anything that would make this over optimistic. Um, and so these are our regression coefficients and that leads to uh, an equation. Um, the, the one that was Dubois and Dubois developed was uh, just slightly different from this. You see those coefficients are a bit different from what we had here. And I think there was a footnote later um, about where you can get the data and learn more uh, that the reference I think to the original 1916 paper in Archives of Internal Medicine is there. So that that equation's been around a while. Now if we plot the predicted values uh, on the log scale against the log of the body surface area as we saw a moment ago you get this nearly perfect fit and the residuals are barely even noticeable. So this is, this is really a strong model. It's a very mechanistic problem that's being studied, so you expect there not to be uh, a lot of random error. Uh, and then we can show the regression equation in two variables in more uh, three-dimensional ways. So let's look at a couple of different ways for doing that. So this is a color image plot where the hue and the saturation within two different hues uh, which is a very effective way to show multiple levels. Um, that is really telling you the predicted value. Uh, and so that goes from uh, magenta up here to the uh, bluish color. And so you see weight on the x-axis, height is on the y-axis, and then the color is telling you the, the body surface area. And this is using the same model to draw a contour plot and so at a certain uh, contour, you can see this is all the combinations of height and weight that gives you a predicted body surface area of 10,000 in some certain units. So it's very easy to envision a multiple regression equation that has two variables. Uh, it gets a little harder when you have more. This is a semi uh, uh, three-dimensional graph called a wireframe plot. So you can see weight and height and body surface area. This is in the original scale. So you see the curvature because these are exponential and multiplicative type of relationships in the original variables. So that's, that's a pretty good way to display. Uh, and if you use like interactive software, it's very easy, say in R, to tell it to make this graph interactive where you can drag and look at this from different uh, viewing angles. So now we turn, in, turn to a different topic, which is uh, number of parameters and degrees of freedom. Uh, this can be a little bit uh, confusing to non-statisticians, and so you have to be clear on the different types of degrees of freedom that there are. Uh, so for a model, when you, when you say the degrees of freedom for a model, you're usually referring to the total number of parameters that you're estimating, not counting any intercepts. For a hypothesis test, the number of degrees of freedom is the number of parameters that are hypothesized to equal specified constants. And those constants that you're testing against are usually zeros for null hypotheses. 
if you're doing a test that involves combinations of multiple parameters, but you're testing that combination against a single constant, uh, the degree of freedom is, is just one, no matter how many parameters that is involving. For example, if you test the null hypothesis that beta 3 is equal to beta 4, uh, that's the same as testing the null hypothesis that beta 3 minus beta 4 is equal to 0, and that is a one degree of freedom test because it tests one parameter. It just happens to be a new parameter that's a combination of old parameters, and it tests that combination against a constant. Now what we're referring to by degrees of freedom in a hypothesis test or a model is what's called the numerator degrees of freedom in an F-test. And then the F-test also has denominator degrees of freedom, which is also called error degrees of freedom. The denominator or error degrees of freedom is equal to the number of observations minus the number of beta parameters that you're estimating minus one for the intercept. And so this is a quantity such that if you calculated the sum of squared errors or residuals and divided by n minus p minus 1, you would get an unbiased estimate of the residual variance sigma squared. So that is penalizing you for how many opportunities p that you had to make the sum of squared errors get small, um, and that's what makes it give rise to an unbiased estimate. So there's other ways to express the degrees of freedom for a hypothesis. It's the number of opportunities you give associations to be present. And for an association to be present means the relationship between y and an x is not flat. Or the degrees of freedom, again, this is numerator degrees of freedom, is the number of restrictions you place on parameters to make the null hypothesis of no association which is flat relationships, to make that hold. So you need to keep those ideas of degrees of freedom in mind as we get into hypothesis testing. So the first hypothesis we test with multiple regression, and often the most important one, is to get an overall analysis of variance table and to test the global null hypothesis that beta 1 is equal to beta 2 all the way out, equal beta p is equal to 0. This is an F uh, test with P degrees of freedom in the numerator because we're testing P things and N minus P minus one in the denominator which goes with the residual variance. So this is a very important test because it tests whether there's any sign of any regression going on. Is there any association with any of the X's and the Y? So this is a test of total association, or the global test of association. To test associate total association, we accumulate the partial effects of all variables in the model, even though we're testing if any of the partial effects is zero. So the global test, or test of total association, is amassing all of the effects that you can estimate and seeing how they accumulate to give you some sort of ability to predict why. The, null, the alternative hypothesis, HA, is that at least one of the betas is zero. It doesn't mean that it's non-zero. It doesn't mean that they all have to be non-zero, just at least one of them. So in the weight and smoking example, the null hypothesis tests that neither weight nor smoking is associated with why, and the alternative is that at least one of them is associated with Y. The test of total association does not test whether cigarette smoking is related to Y holding weight constant. That would be a partial association test with fewer degrees of freedom. Um, now when we're doing um, a overall model we're going to have what's called the sum of squared regression which is also called the model sums of squares. And we had that in simple linear regression, and you remember the sum of squared regression is essentially the sample variance of the predicted values. How different from one another across subjects can you make the predicted values? And the more they differ, the more signal that you have, the more the ability to predict. So it's exactly the same idea with multiple regression.
Now, instead of testing the global null hypothesis, we can test partial effects. H naught beta 1 equals 0 is a test for the effect of x1 on y holding x2 and any other x is constant. So beta 2 is not part of the null or alternative hypothesis. Beta 2 you could call a nuisance parameter. There is something that's in the background that's important to estimate, but it's not important for the moment as part of our formal hypothesis test. Uh, so one way to test beta 1 is with a t-test. You, you get the slope estimate for x1, call it b1, and you get the estimated standard error of b1, and you take that ratio, and that gives you a t-statistic, and that t-statistic has n minus p minus 1 degrees of freedom. Remember, a t-distribution is like an f with 1 degree of freedom in the numerator and however many in the denominator, and it's 1 degree of freedom because we're testing one parameter here. Now, it's hard to write down the formula for standard errors, but all of our software packages do that really easily. So like the one variable case, uh, there's systematic things that make the standard errors get smaller, which will make your power go up, your precision go up. The sample size getting bigger makes the standard error smaller. Uh, the variance of the variable being tested, when that's larger, the standard error of the slope gets smaller because if the span of x is wider, you're anchoring that line uh, and you're able to really nail down the slope much better than if the range of x were very small. When the residual variance goes down, so the amount of unexplained variation, your standard errors of your regression coefficients are also going to go down. So this is just the same as we had before with a simple linear regression. The F-test is another way to get a test of association, and that's going to be identical to the square of the T-statistic when you're testing one variable. But the beauty of the F-test is you can test any subset of variables or test all of the variables. So if you wanted to test whether either systolic or diastolic blood pressure or both is associated with, with uh, time until a stroke, holding weight constant. So now you have three variables in the model. Uh, the F test for testing two of those variables will have two degrees of freedom in the numerator. Now to get a partial F test for, say, those two variables, we need to define the partial sum of squares. The partial sum of squares is the change in the sum of squares when the variables being tested are dropped from the model and the model is refitted. And so you can actually fit this reduced model and find out how much the sum of squared regression got smaller, which will be exactly the same amount by which the sum of squared error gets bigger. So what you're doing in testing uh, the effect of variables is to find out how much harm it does to remove the variables from the model. So if we get a full model, in the example above it would have three variables in it, uh, that will have all the variables and the reduced model has the variables containing only the adjustment variables and not the variables being tested. So we already said you'll increase the sum of squared errors, decrease sum of squared regression by the same amount, and they, these will be changed unless the variable dropped has exactly a zero regression coefficient, which virtually never happens. So we can get the sum of squared errors reduced minus the sum of squared errors full, which is exactly the same as the sum of squared regression full minus the reduced. And the numerator of the F test can use, uh, uh, you can calculate the difference in degrees of freedom to get the numerator of the F test. So the form of the partial F test is a change in the sum of squares when dropping the variables of interest divided by the change in degrees of freedom. And then you divide by the mean squared error, uh, which is what we got from the full model. So the full model has p slopes, and if we want to test q of those slopes, so say systolic and diastolic blood pressure, uh, 
we want to test. That's two degrees of freedom. Q is equal to two. So you take uh, the difference in the sum of squared from the reduced versus the smaller sum of squared errors in the full, divided by how many things you're testing, Q, and then you divide that by your original mean squared error. And that's the same that's also subtracting sum of squared regression in the opposite order. And that is your F test. It's going to have Q degrees of freedom in the numerator and like before, n minus p minus 1 in the denominator. So q is going to be the number of variables you're testing. That is your hypothesis degrees of freedom, your numerator degree of freedom. So now we talk about looking at goodness of fit of the model. There's various assumptions we're making, such as linearity of each predictor against y holding the other predictors constant. We're assuming that the variance of the residuals is constant, independent of any x's. And then we're assuming the observations are independent of each other, which will come from the design. Uh, I can't really test that very well. And then for proper statistical inference, in other words, accurate p-values and confidence intervals, you need the residuals to be normally distributed unconditionally which means your y variable needs to be conditionally normal to normally distributed if you fix x. Next, we're assuming the x's act additively. Uh, the effect of xj does not depend on the other x's. It, it doesn't assume that the x's are uncorrelated. That's a totally different issue. So the correlation between x's, which could be called collinearity, is completely distinct from interaction. Um, now we're also, um, I don't know if we, st yeah, we, we stated the linearity assumption up front. So what about verifying some of the assumptions? Well, if P is equal to 2 and X1 is continuous and X2 is binary, the pattern of Y versus X1 with points identified by X2, you should see two straight parallel lines. So beta 2 will be the slope of Y versus X2 holding X1 constant which is the difference in means for x1 equals 1 versus 0 uh, uh, in, the, in this simple case. So this is just showing that with a graph. And so we have raw data points that are simulated. And we are simulating from a model where the x1 effect is linear and where there is no interaction between x1 and x2. x2 is a binary variable. So the effect of x2 is to just to jump from one group to another. So this is when x2 is equal to 0. This is when x2 is equal to 1. And so you get this bump in the intercept equal to beta 2, which is the x2 effect. So that, that is the x2 effect, that vertical spacing there. And then the beta 1 effect, the rise over run for x1, is just the slope of this x1 variable. So this, that's what our simplest model in two variables needs to have happen. Parallelism, which means equal slopes, which means no interaction. Linearity, and then looking at constant variability going across x1, and also the variability of the points is the same for x2 equal to 0 and for x2 equal to 1. So that pretty much displays all of our assumptions uh, except for the independence assumption. So we're going to make residual plots to show hopefully there's no systematic patterns in the data. Um, and then we can also make partial residual plots to show adjusted effects. Um, I don't find those quite as useful, but some people really do. And this goes into that a little bit more. So that was data satisfying all of our assumptions. And then um, we already talked last time about QQ plots for looking at normality of the residuals. So we're going to get into multiple regression with a binary predictor in a little more detail here. So we're going to have an indicator variable for a two-level categorical predictor, like male and female. But we're going to call the categories A and B. The first category is just going to be taken as a reference cell, and it's going to get the zero. And the second category gets an indicator variable value of 1.0, just by convention. It doesn't have to be that way.
So our formal definition of an indicator variable is we're using this bracket notation. So x is equal uh, bracket category equals b means um, that x will be 1 if you're in category b and x will be 0 if you're in category a. And so our model is going to be alpha plus beta x is alpha plus beta times the indicator of being in category B. So alpha is the mean for category A subjects. Alpha plus beta is the mean for category B subjects. And the difference in means, which is the beta coefficient, is um, just, it's just, uh, that's what it is. Difference in means is beta for B minus A. Now this leads us to the ability to easily do a two sample t-test uh, with linear regression. And so they're really equivalent in every sense because we just showed that the slope of a binary predictor is just the difference in the two means. So you're going to get the same p-value for comparing the two means with a t-test as you do with regression with a single binary x. You're going to get the same estimates and the same confidence limits and they make exactly the same assumptions. So when you solve for the least squared estimates in this simple case, the intercept is just the mean in group A. The slope is the difference in means between group B and group A. So it's just as simple as that. Um, and then your standard error of the, um, of the slope is just the standard error of the difference in means, which is exactly what the formula we had when we were talking way back about the two sample t-test. Now when you get into analysis of covariance or you just add predictors to this having the single binary x in your model, you really start to see where the flexibility of regression comes in. because This can extend the t-test and do things it's not able to do. So you can extend it by adding continuous adjustment variables or categorical adjustment variables and you can also extend it by having more than one indicator variable and that will handle a multi-group problem which is what ANOVA does. But if you add covariates in addition to that you'll have ANCOVA, analysis of covariance. So we'll be talking about this lead data set uh, from uh, Rosner, Rosner's book. So we have lead exposure of children versus the neuropsychological function and the neuropsychological function is measured by this maximum finger wrist tapping score which is almost continuous and fairly normally distributed and uh, we're going to write the model as the mean max FWT is alpha plus beta 1 times the age effect plus beta 2 times the sex effect and we're going to use 0 1 for male and female and that means alpha is the mean y value for a zero-year-old male because male is the reference group zero here and beta one is the increase in the mean y per one unit increase in age if you don't change to a different sex group and beta two is the mean y for females minus the mean y for males holding age constant so if you do, as Rosner did in his book, uh, define an arbitrary exposure variable uh, to lead dose uh, as whether the child had uh, a concentration in their body of more than uh, 40 milligrams per 100 milliliters in either of the two measurement years, 1972 or 73, then we can have an indicator variable in the model for that. Um, I think I have a note here somewhere that that's really a questionable practice. I don't think that should have ever been an example in a statistics textbook uh, because it's really not good statistical practice uh, to take an exposure variable and not be able to do a dose response relationship for that exposure. Uh, and this 40 threshold is, is very arbitrary, but we're sticking with that for the moment uh, in this simple model going to take a brief diversion and revisit the correlation coefficient. You remember this formula we had for that and it's a unitless measure. Um, 
and the correlation coefficient is between minus 1 and 1. The t-test for a correlation coefficient is identical to the t-test for a regression slope when there's a single variable in the model, and the square of the correlation is exactly the capital R squared for the model, and you can see how to get the F statistic from the ratio of R squared and 1 minus R squared. Um, and the R squared is measuring the fraction of variation in Y that is explained jointly by all the X's. So the general form of R squared, R squared is the sum of squared regression divided by the sum of squared total. So this is essentially the variance of the predicted values divided by the variance of the raw Y value. And that's also identical to taking 1 minus the fraction of unexplained variability. So the variance of the residuals divided by the variance of Y, uh, subtract that from 1, that's the alternative form for R squared. So R squared is the fraction of variation in Y that was explainable by the X's, and it's often called the coefficient of determination. It's between 0 and 1. It doesn't have a sign on it like the little r. And if the predicted values are the same for all observations, meaning they have to be equal to the mean of y, then the sum of squared errors is equal to the sum of squared total, and your r squared is going to be 0. The r squared is going to be 1 when the predicted value is the observed value. So you have no error. The residuals are all 0. Sum of squared errors is 0. You get an r squared of 1. And as we said before, the r squared is identical to the little r squared in the single predictor case. Now we can use regression for ANOVA, as I mentioned before. So regression can handle any number of categories in the predictors. And so in this lead data set, we really had the lead levels measured uh, in 1972 and 1973. And, uh, the original analysis classified the lead exposure uh, and labeled as a, a control child, as a child that had the lead levels bef below 40 in both 72 and 73. A currently exposed child is one with elevated lead levels in the later year, but not in the first year. And previously exposed is elevated in the first year uh, but not in the second year. So this is not really a very sensible way to look at this because you're ignoring all of this exposure information above 40 and all the information below 40. So we'll be doing a continuous analysis later. So now we have three groups as listed here. So we're going to need two indicator variables and that will perfectly describe three categories. So we have X1 is the indicator of whether or not you're currently exposed, X2 for previously exposed, and our reference group, which is going to get the intercept, is the con control group. The child was not exposed in, in uh, any, any of the two years. So this is our model. The expected uh, finger wrist tapping neurologic sign uh, score, given the exposure, is alpha plus beta 1 X1 plus beta 2 x2. So alpha it goes with the controls. Uh, alpha plus beta 1 is the mean in the currently exposed, and alpha plus beta 2 is the mean in the previously exposed group. So beta 1 and beta 2 are offsets. They are differences off of the original intercept, as always. So alpha is the mean score for controls. Beta is the mean for the currently exposed uh, minus the mean for the controls. Beta 2 is the mean for the previously exposed minus the mean for controls. And the difference um, is the um, beta 2 minus beta 1 is the mean for previously exposed minus the mean for currently exposed. So it's very easy to get that alternate contrast. Now the astute uh, student will be asking herself at this point, besides why we're not using a dose response model, is what happened to the age because you would expect the neurologic uh, measurement, a finger wrist tapping score, 
to be something that changes with age and we're not adjusting for age. We'll need to do that in a later analysis. So uh, we do have some missing data on the dependent variable. So you can see our regression degrees of freedom is two. That, that's also called our model degrees of freedom. Our residual degrees of freedom is equal to 99 minus 2 minus 1, or 96. Our residual standard deviation is 12.3, and our R squared is 0.1. Now, adjusted R squared is using a formula that's going to create a less biased estimate of the true R squared. Now, the R squared is very low here, so just knowing whether or not you had an exposure in one of the one or both of those years, uh, you're not really explaining much of this test score. And here are our estimates. Um, and then we can plot our um, estimated mean y as a function of all the different groups. And so we're asking for all the predictions. And you see that the predicted finger wrist tapping score um, for the um, controls is a little higher. And then for those that had uh, an exposure in 72 but not in 73, it's a little lower. And for those that were exposed more recently, it's, it's lower still. And then we can show the contrast. This is just showing the same thing again, uh, but showing differences and getting confidence intervals for differences between groups. So in general, if you have K categories and you want to do ANOVA with regression, you'll need K minus 1 indicator variables. And for testing or prediction, the choice of the reference cell is completely irrelevant. It does matter for interpreting individual regression coefficients. And so software will generate these automatically. In Stata, it's, you have to do one little step to make this happen. But in R, you never have to worry about it. So the, the indicator variables are automatically generated if you start with a factor variable or a character variable. So to obtain uh, ANOVA with multiple regression, we estimate the intercept alpha and the regression coefficients beta sub j using standard least squares. Our F test for overall regression is exactly the F for ANOVA if you're not adjusting for covariates. In ANOVA, the sum of squared regression is called the sum of squares between treatments, and the sum of squared errors is called the sum of squares within treatments. But since you now know how to do this with regression, there's no reason to learn special formulas for ANOVA or to use special software that's made for ANOVA. Just use regression. So now we're going to get into one-way analysis of covariance a little bit more. We're just doing nothing more but adding other variables to the model. So we almost don't need the terminology analysis of covariance. Just call it a regression model. So an example is you have treatment, and you want to compare treatment A and B, but you would like to take out some of the variation in Y that's explainable by age. So age is the adjustment variable, or covariate, and the global lift test will test whether either age or treatment is related to the response. But we're going to be more interested in testing whether the treatment effect is there after you adjust for the age effect. So this is going to need a partial F test for treatment. That's based on the partial sum of squares for treatment adjusted for age. So we have a model now where our dependent variable is the same, and we've got two predictors in the model in the, in the lead data set. So we have age and group, and we look at the output, and we see that um, the group variable is still having two indicator variables exactly as before, uh, but the age variable now um, really has a huge effect. And the older the child gets, the higher uh, they, they get on that score. So there is a maturation effect uh, in this neuromuscular control. And you see the R squared went up 
enormously. So I think it's fair to say that any analysis that did not adjust for age is really not going to be a very good analysis. And that would be even more true if the ages are different for the children of different exposure groups. You'll be attributing some of the exposure effect to that's uh, uh, really from age. And so when we get our predictions now, this is what analysis of covariance looks like. <clears throat> We have age on the x-axis, and we have our three groups. So you can see how going from one group to the next, you have a change in intercepts. But the slopes are the same. We did not allow for an interaction with age and group. This is our analysis of variance for the model. Um, we have one degree of freedom for age because it has one parameter. We have two degrees of freedom for group. And then we have our total uh, effect of age and group combined, which is the regression uh, sum of squares. So this is the, the regular SSR. It comes from three parameters. Now, you can't just add this and this together to get this. Uh, the only time that that works is when the variables are perfectly uncorrelated with each other in linear regression. So you have the partial effect of age if you held group constant, partial effect of group if you held age constant, and then you get mean squared by dividing the partial sum of squares by the degrees of freedom. So here the degrees of freedom was 1, so it didn't change. And then you have, uh, you divide 810 by 2 to get that one. And now you get your sum of squared uh, errors, and you can get your estimate of the residual variance of 90. And you're going to use this mean squared error here uh, in, in these other things to get the F. So if you take this mean squared divided by that, you get an F ratio of 67. This divided by that, you get a 4.5. And um, this tells us the evidence for any sort of effect. This divided by that is 28. Uh, so you see this huge evidence for uh, some kind of age effect and more modest evidence for the lead exposure effect, at least in this uh, dichotomous fashion of measuring exposure. Now, if we to do, were to do a reduced model, uh, we can take uh, age out of the model and just test group, and we get 1,600. So you see that we could explain a variation of 1,600 from group, but about half of that, so you compare that with this, about half of that is really due to age, uh, age differences across the group. So in... Uh, the next time, uh, the next session, we're going to go through a continuous analysis of lead exposure, which I think is a lot more uh, satisfying, and uh, that will be an example of having two continuous predictors in the model, plus we're going to have age in the model also. So I uh, hope to see you uh, next time. Hope to hear from you on datamethods.org to keep questions and discussions going, and stay safe, everybody.